Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting of the Housing Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman. Present. Howard. Present. Tice. Present. Nick Badgett. Present. Bliss. Present. Gomez. Present. Hassan. Present. Heinrich. Heinrich. Her. Present. Jurgens. Jurgens, present. Olson. Present. Barr. Present. And Ryer. Present. Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. The next order of business is approval of the minutes from Tuesday, February 16. Uh, Representative Howard, have you had a chance to review those minutes? Yes, Madam Chair, so moved. Representative Howard moves approval of the minutes. Uh, any discussion? If not, uh, members, please unmute yourselves for a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Um, opposed nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Uh, members, today we uh, are going to hear three bills whose goals are to improve the eviction process in Minnesota. The bills collectively uh, make changes to the steps before an eviction action is brought, reforming the eviction court process, and allowing for expungement in certain cases after someone has an eviction on their record. Because these bills are to each other, we've had a number of testifiers speak to all three bills. So today we'll have introductory remarks and an overview of each bill. After that, we'll go to public testimony. And finally, we will conclude with moving each bill and voting on final passage out of committee. All three of the bills go on to judiciary. Um, and so this is their, this is their um, uh, first step. Uh, we haven't done uh, a great deal of uh, uh, tenant protection over the years. And so the last couple of years, we've, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about this, uh, this particular issue. We have testifiers both in support and opposition of the bill. The first bill is Representative Hassan's House File 20. Representative Hassan, to your bill. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Thank Please you. Proceed. For, oh, sorry. Um, proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. I want to thank you for this opportunity to present House File 20, an act relating to real property modifying termination of tenants as well and require a residential tenant to notice of grounds for eviction before an action may be brought. We're amending Minnesota Statute 2020 sections 504B-135, 504B-321. Um, as you guys know, 2020 has thrown many surprises at us, including a pandemic that took many lives, confined us in our homes and shut down our economy. When the governor announced a shelter in place, we had thousands of Minnesotans who had no place to call home. We also witnessed the murder of George Floyd, followed by the civil unrest that left many business burned to the ground. I guess we can all say 2020 had been one heck of a year. Thousands of Minnesotans have lost their jobs, which left them unable to pay rent and mortgages, buy food or continue to provide for their families. With the help of the fiction moratorium in place, we can keep families housed for now. But then what happens after the moratorium ends? As we all know, evictions are not a COVID-related issue only. We had thousands of Minnesotan families struggling with evictions on their record prior to COVID. According to researchers, the people facing the highest risk of evictions are low-income women of color, followed closely by families with children and domestic violence victims. Families who are evicted regularly lose their possessions, lose their jobs, and experience higher rates of depression, and for children, the instability caused by eviction can result in worse outcomes in education, health, and future earnings. What House File 20 is intending to do is give tenants 14 day notice prior to filing eviction. It takes about 21 days for Hennepin County emergency assistance to be processed. That was prior to COVID-19 and 14 days for Ramsey County. If someone suddenly lose their job and must seek assistance, it takes at least two weeks or more to be approved for any assistance. And this legislation is giving folks more time to find the appropriate assistance needed before an eviction is filed. It's a fact that eviction is costly, impacts families and individuals negatively for many years to come. So it's my understanding that we're avoiding the filing of eviction in the first place and finding a common ground with landlords. 
Eviction hurts families. Eviction is one of the top reasons why people are homeless. Eviction costs a lot of money and not to mention it's cheaper to keep families housed than house them after an eviction or after they have been homeless. Uh, it's worth noting that the governor's office as well as the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency support this legislation uh, and all the legislation you're gonna hear today to modify our eviction laws. With that, Madam Chair, I think I have testifiers who can um, walk through the bill. I think you have Mr. McDonough, who's, uh, who's uh, maybe part of the uh, initial overview of the, of the bill. Mr. McDonough. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hassan. Again, uh, my name is Larry McDonough. I'm senior counsel with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, I've been a housing attorney for almost 40 years. I've got about 10,000 tenants and landlords that I've represented under my belt. Uh, I've been involved with housing legislation since around 1986. And also in 1986, I started as a landlord uh, off and on over the years and sold my last property about five years ago. So I think I understand um, both sides of the landlord kind of equation. Um, the 14 day notice provision that's in the bill is um, there's already a 14 day notice permission provision in Minnesota statute 504 B.135. What this does is it changes it from a per permissive notice to a mandatory notice. And it's based on other notice provisions that we have in Minnesota law. The 14 day notice uh, is the same as the notice that a tenant must give a landlord before bringing a rent escrow action or a tenant remedies action for habitability problems. It's also the uh, same as what you have in for public housing tenants as well. So what the notice, what this uh, bill requires is that the notice state uh, the amount that's due uh, it's, and, and that it include information about the tenant might be uh, eligible for financial assistance. And it also makes, um, it, it also clarifies that this type of notice uh, meet some of the requirements for getting emergency assistance. As uh, the representative noted, there have been problems uh, with delays in emergency assistance with trying to verify whether there is a debt and what the amount is. And what this does is um, states that this type of notice uh, satisfies some of those requirements. So hopefully it will streamline the process for uh, getting emergency assistance. Um, and I just have to say from my experience, both as an attorney uh, representing tenants in public housing, that notice in public housing has led to, I think, way less um, eviction cases for non-payment of rent than we would have seen otherwise. It uh, gives both the parties an opportunity to discuss the problem, figure out if the rent debt can be cured, uh, get emergency assistance. And in some situations, uh, it, it encourages the tenant to move because this property is not affordable and that it leads to less evictions, less homelessness, less uh, shelter costs, and, and really increases housing stability. Um, so I think with that, I will um, stop talking and uh, see if there are questions now or questions. And later. members, I think what we're going to do is um, uh, present the bills and uh, hear the testifiers. And then when we move the bills, uh, we'll go to, uh, to member questions. Uh, then we have House File 1060, Representative Agbaje, if you would uh, speak to your bill. Sure. Do you want me to speak to the amendment now as well? Uh, it's the bill and then the amendment. OK. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Today I'm presenting House File 1060. This bill focuses on the eviction process in the court system. When a landlord seeks to evict a tenant, the process in Minnesota is one of the fastest in the country, taking as little as eight days after filing. In just one week, a whole family's life can be turned upside down. An eviction makes it harder to find new housing, more likely that a family will end up in worse housing or possibly with no options at all. This is detrimental to a person's physical and mental health, prevents the ability to maintain a job, and harms children's performance in school. But today we have an opportunity to make the court process clear, less chaotic, more helpful, and more humane. Eviction comes down hardest on Minnesota's low-income families across the state. As an attorney who has volunteered at the Hennepin County Housing Court Project for more than three years, I have seen firsthand how fearful tenants are of losing their homes. I frequently counsel people who fall behind on rent 
and who just need time to apply for emergency assistance. If this bill becomes law, tenants and landlords would have the time to find a meaningful solution and not have to go to court as often. The main purpose of this bill is to add an additional seven days between the summons and the first court appearance, and it also adds 10 days between the court appearance and trial. This, modest, this modestly lengthens the eviction process, thereby allowing tenants to either make a payment plan with the landlord or seek legal advice. This bill also requires more information in the summons so tenants can know exactly how they may have breached the lease. The updated process in this bill creates a more just system for all parties that ensures due process and helps them understand their rights. As you'll hear from my two testifiers, Mr. Elwood and Ms. Dobson, this bill is vital to update our laws to meet the changing realities of our state. And, and then, you, and then yeah. you have an author's amendment. Yes, and then the author's amendment, um, what it does is it removes uh, some of the new initial language surrounding what would make a deficient filing. Um, so, it, so instead of the new language, it goes back to the old language that's currently in, in place in the law. And then another piece of the amendment removes the specificity and resources that allow for, so the court would only have to need to provide general information about resources that are available across the state in the summons as well as the writ. Um, and with that, I can go to my testifier. And then um, to provide uh, additional uh, overview, uh, Joey Dobson and Ron Elwood from Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Dobson. Uh, Madam Chair. Oh, are, uh, Mr. Elwood, you're going first? Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Elwood. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. Thank you, Representative Abhijay, for bringing this uh, bill uh, forward. Um, you know, eviction is a life-altering event. It has severe consequences, not just for the person that's losing their home, but also for generations to come. It's perpetuating poverty, housing instability, and racial injustice. And what this bill, uh, as Representative Abhijay uh, pointed out, is to simply provide more due process. The fact is there is more time to adjudicate a garden variety contract dispute between two businesses or dispute over whether someone's tree encroaches upon their neighbor's property than a person gets to defend against the loss of their home. The statutory eviction process is, has been virtually unchanged since 1858 when Minnesota became a state. Legal aid handles more than 10% of the 15,000 or so eviction cases statewide a, a year but in 70% of those cases, our clients have a valid and persuasive legal defense. But I really wanna be crystal clear. This bill in no way impugns landlords or implies in any way that many landlords don't work hard with their tenants to avoid eviction. It does not suggest in any way that being a landlord is easy or that they are not providing critical housing it does not suggest that many, many landlords don't follow the law. But at the, at the same time, we're not suggesting that the timeline stretch out interminably. This bill recognizes importantly that the importance of quickly removing a tenant who under the statutes is causing a nuisance or other illegal behavior that seriously endangers the safety of other residents. Nothing in this bill changes the existing right to an expedited uh, eviction in these circumstances. Um, we have had discussions with the multi-housing association. We do not suggest in any way that the many points we have heard from them or that others you will hear today from uh, those opposing the bill are without merit. We do not suggest that. We are not unmindful that most evictions are for non-payment and that the landlord often needs the rent to pay bills and mortgage, maintain the property, and in fact, if the tenant has no case, to turn the unit over quickly. But justice is ensuring a failed, fair balance of the interest between the plaintiff and the defendant, and that's what this bill intends to do. And the question, therefore, before your, this committee is to, term, to determine to the extent there is civil, healthy, and respectful disagreement among reasonable positions, which one carries the day and which will help, most importantly, the most Minnesotans maintain housing stability and break the generational poverty chain. 
As always, we respect those with differing views than ours and are always interested in working with them to seek a reasonable compromise. Thank you very much. And then is Joey Dobson speaking to the bill as well? Yes, she is, Madam Chair. Ms. Dobson. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joey Dobson, attorney with Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. First, I'd like to thank Representative Abadjai for bringing this bill forward and for the co-authorship on this committee from Representative Gomez and Representative Hassan. Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid represents thousands of tenants each year. Along with our legal services partners, we advise and represent tenants facing housing instability. Evictions are trauma. And the manner and pace upon which current law requires the cases to be processed is archaic and frankly, unworkable. The current statutory timeline and lack of meaningful due process runs counter to the goals of the justice system to provide due process and to reach a truthful, fair result. Minnesota has one of the fastest eviction court processes in the nation. It's time for that to change. I'll now briefly describe the provisions of this bill and we'll be happy to answer questions that arise. First, the first section of this bill removes the word summary from the description of an eviction case. Sections two and three address tenant screening companies, prohibiting them from reporting an eviction unless a writ of recovery has been issued. It requires a tenant screening agency to check the court records 24 hours before issuing any report of an eviction. It also makes the remedy for a violation of this provision meaningful and usable for aggrieved tenants. Section four regards the complaint and summons that initiate an eviction process. When a landlord files an eviction case, they file a complaint with the court, which contains the allegations. The court then issues a summons with information about the court hearing. This provision requires the complaint to provide a copy of the lease and a little more specificity about what the allegations are. This provision requires that the summons issued by the court include information about how to participate in the court hearing, whether that's by phone, by Zoom, or in person, and how to get an interpreter if needed. It also provides information for where a tenant can get help. The section also amends uh, the timeline for the court hearing as Representative Abadje uh, mentioned. Now the court hearing must be scheduled between seven and 14 days from the date the case is filed. But the tenant might only know about the case for a handful of days before the hearing. This provision requires that the first court appearance be scheduled at least 14 days after the date of filing. Finally, this section specifies that an eviction court record shall remain non-public until the court has heard and made a determination in the case. Section five amends the service timelines to comply with the other sections and requires plaintiffs who are using um, service by mail and posting to tell the tenants about the case by the normal forms of communication they use, whether that's text message or email um, or whatever the case may be. Section six um, is regarding the court hearing and trial scheduling. Current law presumes that the court will conduct a full evidentiary hearing and trial at that very first court appearance. Current law only allows the court to continue that trial for six calendar days. This section of the bill specifies that at the first hearing, the court will either dismiss the action, approve a settlement, or schedule a trial. It requires that the trial must be scheduled at, scheduled at least 10 days after that first hearing. This provides time for all parties, the time to do factual discovery, and seek legal counsel and potentially negotiate a settlement. Finally, this section eliminates the requirement that a tenant must pay money into court in order to have a trial. Section seven offers a process um, for a landlord and a tenant to enforce a settlement agreement in court. Section eight provides that if a court finds for the plaintiff, the landlord, and issues a writ of recovery that it provides seven days minimum for the, for the renter to find new housing before the sheriff shows up to execute the writ. Section nine uh, simply clarifies a defendant's right to uh, move to vacate a judgment. And section 10 requires that 
a writ of recovery when posted on a renter's door include basic information about legal resources, financial assistance, and shelter. The moment when a family is at risk of winding up on the streets is a crucial time for this information to be provided. And then finally, sections 11, 12, 13, and 14 provide the same right to a renter to appeal a decision as defendants in any other civil case. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for your critical work on housing issues for Minnesotans. I appreciate the time to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I think as we move each bill, uh, we'll go to uh, member questions. Um, Representative Hassan, House File 265, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and members. So this uh, bills are a sequence. So the first one that I presented was before an eviction is filed and this one was during the eviction. And um, the one that I'm house file 265 is dealing with once an eviction is filed. Um, I'm not going to go back to like my whole speech about how eviction is costly, it is harmful, and it, it impacts uh, the lowest income and the most vulnerable of our community. But what House File uh, 265 does is it would add a court finding that a conviction case is no longer a reasonable predictor of future behavior as a finding that would allow them to expunge an eviction file. It would also require the court to order an expungement in the following circumstances. If the defendant prevailed the case in the merits, uh, the court will dismiss the plaintiff complaint uh, and the parties have agreed an expungement as well as um, on the motion of the defendant case is settled and the defendant fulfills terms of the settlement. Um, and also, um, it will also make evictions and non-public data. As we know, you know, our court system is you are innocent until proven guilty. So the notion that somebody can file a judgment against you and before a judge sees that judgment and makes a decision, um, it's a public record and people can use that to discriminate uh, you just isn't, isn't fair, isn't just, and um, it's something that we need to deal with. With that, I will uh, have Larry McDonald just uh, walk through the bill. Mr. McDonough, to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hassan. Um, first, just a, a brief background on current expungement law. Um, it's in 484.014. It's got two categories, mandatory and discretionary expungement. Mandatory is limited to just a couple of types of cases involving mortgage foreclosures and contracts for deed where a tenant moves or an occupant moves before the eviction or a tenant didn't receive a proper notice. Uh, and very few evictions fit into those categories. Um, discretionary expungement is available when the tenant can show that the eviction case um, was weak in merit uh, with, and expungement is clearly in the interest of justice and interest not outweighed by the public's interest in knowing about it. And the effect of these standards is to make it pretty hard to get expungements. Um, it leaves thousands of eviction cases on records for many years. Uh, a tenant has to pay around $300 to file a motion for an expungement. It's kind of hard to prove what happened um, many years later. Um, a lot of landlords use the existence of the eviction case as a red flag and tenants can't even get past that to show their viability. And so what this bill does, and, and just to, to note again that this bill is also included in House File 835 and has the support of the governor and the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. So what the bill does is it, it's a fairly small bill. It's got three sections. I'm gonna start with um, the section on mandatory expungement, which is section two. So what it does is it adds more categories to mandatory expungement. And uh, Representative Hassan went through those. Uh, essentially, it's if the tenant is winning the case or the parties have agreed to expungement, if there's a settlement and the tenant fulfills that settlement, or if the case is older than three years old. And so it changes discretionary expungement to allow the court to look at whether this eviction case is a reasonable predictor of future behavior. And briefly, I had a case a few years ago where uh, a couple of young women had been um, 
they were tenants, they were college students, and they were friends of some high school kids that got killed in a school shooting in Cold Spring. And they were both going back and back to Cold Spring for funerals and other things. And, and neither each one thought the other had paid the rent. And so the landlord filed an eviction case against them because the landlord didn't know what was going on. And they came back to find this, they reached a settlement, but that eviction case stayed on their record and they were not able to get an expungement under the statute because the landlord hadn't done anything wrong. So discretionary expungement required them to show the landlord had done something wrong with the case and had the what the bill has, which would allow the court to say, well, you know, that's a pretty extreme situation. That doesn't seem to be a reasonable predictor that these young women are going to be bad tenants in the future. Under this current bill, that uh, eviction case would have been expunged uh, at that time under the statute. And lastly, it adds to um, a non-public record status, an eviction that is pending. And so once there's an outcome, if there's an outcome in favor of the landlord, then it becomes public. So what we think the effect of this is that it'll allow more tenants to get past the flag of an eviction to show their viability as a tenant. And that will lead to less homelessness and less shelters. And as a farmer landlord, I can say that there's nothing in this law that would have um, this bill that would have required me to rent to anyone. And it would still allow me to screen for references as I always did when I was a landlord. Um, and so with that, um, I will stop talking. Thank you. And, and members, here's, here's how we'll um, proceed with uh, questions. We're, we're now going to take public testimony. We have a number of testifiers. When the testimony is over, we'll pause at that point if you have questions, if there are member questions of the testifiers, then we'll move each uh, bill. And as we move each bill, uh, you may have a, um, a time for to question the, uh, the author of the bill. So we'll have several, several pauses. So we'll go to public testimony. Sue uh, Kesterman from uh, Churches United and is also Homes for All co-chair. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Pastor Sue Kesterman, and I serve as Chief Executive Officer at Churches United for the Homeless in Moorhead. I also serve as one of the co-chairs for the Homes for All Coalition. Thank you, Chair Hausman and representatives for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'd like to speak in support of these House files. Uh, House File 20 and House File 265 are on the main agenda. Uh, for Homes for All this legislative session, and House File 1060 is on our support agenda. Uh, at Churches United for the Homeless, we provide safe shelter, stable housing, nutritious food, and a path towards healing for some of our most needy neighbors in the Fargo-Moorhead community. I'd like to speak on behalf of extending the time frame in which uh, a remedy can be sought before eviction and then also for expungement. Currently in Fargo-Moorhead, there are about 250 people who are on the waiting list for shelter beds. Many of them on that waiting list for shelter beds because of an eviction. Oftentimes, if a little bit more time is allowed, those folks might have been able to find a solution, a safe landing pad prior to eviction, and maybe they wouldn't be on the waiting list for shelter. Eviction is a traumatic experience in the life of an individual or a family. And not only is it traumatic in the moment, it is also something that haunts that individual or family for the long term. One of the shelters we operate is called Micah's Mission, and we offer emergency shelter to men, women, and families in the Fargo-Moorhead area. One of our current families at Micah's Mission is a family with an, a mom and a dad, an eight-year-old daughter, and an infant who is about four months old. Uh, the mom and the dad um, are fairly recently together, um, and they have been at the shelter now for about 10 months. They do not qualify for permanent supportive housing with case management supports because their vulnerability and barriers to stability and housing once they're placed are not great enough for that. 
the dad has old evictions on his record that are more than four years old. And those evictions on his record have prevented this family from accessing a new lease to housing in our community. And so they are here at the shelter and have been for a long time. Um, and it's very challenging for them. It's very challenging uh, for the eight-year-old daughter to be able to um, engage helpfully with school and learning. Shelter is never where we want families to end up. And if we can find ways um, to allow time so that families can find other options within their natural support system, and when there is an eviction on someone's record, if it's appropriate for that to be expunged, uh, a vehicle needs to be provided for that. Um, all of us need home as that stable platform for the rest of our lives, for employment, for school, for thriving. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to respond to questions later. Thank you for your testimony. We are joined now by Ann Applebaum, Violence Free Minnesota. Ms. Applebaum, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ann Applebaum, the Housing and Economic Justice Policy Program Manager at Violence Free Minnesota. We're a statewide coalition of uh, 90 member programs who provide advocacy and services to domestic violence and sexual violence victims and survivors in all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I'm testifying today in support of House Files 20, 1060, and 265. The interconnectedness of domestic violence and housing insecurity is staggering. We know that over 90% of homeless women have experienced domestic violence or sexual assault during their lives and over 50% cite domestic violence as the immediate cause of their homelessness. Domestic violence has been identified as one of the top five reasons people experience homelessness in Minnesota. Survivors are plunged into homelessness due to a lack of access to safe and affordable housing. And one of the common barriers to safe and affordable housing are evictions. Survivors face evictions for issues that are directly stem from the abuse they experience such as evictions for noise disturbances or property damages caused by their partner. Some even risk evictions for simply calling police for assistance. The underlying dynamics of abuse make survivors more vulnerable to the risk of an eviction. Studies have found that approximately 99%, 99% of survivors are experiencing financial abuse in their relationships. This can include an abusive partner stealing a survivor's money outright, forcefully uh, preventing them from continuing to work or hiding financial information, such as information related to rental payments. Regardless of what triggers an eviction, the negative impact for survivors is immense. In surveying our member programs, we know that the negative impacts of evictions are harming survivors across the entire state of Minnesota. An eviction can create insurmountable hurdles to housing, such as rental applications being denied outright due to the prior eviction, or increased security deposit requirements that the survivor cannot afford. For instance, we know from talking with mega pro member programs that in one northern region of the state, landlords are asking for double the rent, uh, double the rent deposit when survivors have an eviction on their record. This is what leads to homelessness. This is what prevents survivors from fleeing abuse. We cannot have victims facing the choice of living with continuing violence or being homeless. House Files 20, 1060, and 265 contain practical solutions to barriers that survivors face every day. Financial assistance and legal defenses specific to survivors are often available in eviction matters, but survivors cannot access them due to how rapidly cases move forward. Survivors need notice and ample time to connect with a domestic violence advocate who can help them identify those resources and avoid a needless or improper eviction. Increased access to expungement and measures protecting the reporting of eviction filings need to be in place to ensure that survivors are not prevented access to housing due to a past eviction that in no way is reflection of, reflective of them as future tenants. Implementing these bills can prevent survivors from facing homelessness and create increased safety and stability for survivors and their children. Thank you for letting me testify here today and um, with me as well is uh, Carol Coles Cleese from one of our member programs, Women's Shelter and Support Center in Rochester, who is here to testify about what they are seeing locally. Thank and you. Um, um, Kara uh, Hole, please, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. 
Yes, that was very close. It's Kara Hul Cleese, um, Director of Housing at Women's Shelter and Support Center, um, and Chair Hausman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, at my, so Women's Shelter and Support Center is a domestic violence agency in Southeastern Minnesota. Um, I currently oversee our non-emergency housing programs and manage the nine market rental units that we rent out to survivors. And I'm here today to testify in support of House Files 20, 1060, and 265. For many survivors, evictions are not a rare occurrence or an occasional barrier. Many of the survivors we work with in our shelter and housing programs are facing eviction or have a prior eviction on the record. And most often when we see those evictions, they're the direct result of circumstances relating to their abusive partner. Survivors we work with, particularly single mothers, are already juggling so many things challenging that are at that time. Safety concerns, trauma, um, needs of their children, work, school, and so many other responsibilities. Navigating housing issues on top of that can be impossible. Women's Health and Support Center has resources that are intended to help survivors deal with these housing challenges and avoid evictions. Our staff is all familiar with the various housing protections that are available to survivors facing housing issues, and we can help link survivors to legal assistance, such as local eviction clinics or legal aid resources in surrounding counties. And in some cases, we also have funds available that can help with back rent to avoid the eviction in the first place. But with the process moving so fast, most often we don't have contact with the survivor until after the case is underway or completed and too late to provide this support. Once an eviction is on a survivor's record, we see it follow them for years and years, blocking their ability to find safe and stable housing. I would like to share one example of this horrible pattern. We were working with a woman who many years ago was able to divorce an abusive partner, but when he left the home and failed to provide any financial assistance, she struggled with the rental payments and was evicted. This woman and her child were forced to double up with family. They eventually moved into our shelter. After exiting shelter, we were able to house her in one of our rental units. And during this time, she gained stability for herself and her child. She found a job, was enrolled in school, and after some time, she decided to move closer to family. She secured a transfer for her employment and began her housing search. Yet, Despite at that time being employed, financially stable, and surrounded by a support network, she could not find housing due to her prior eviction. This was an eviction that was now over seven years old, an eviction that was clearly related to the abusive situation that she was no longer in. Still, during her housing search, she had several rental applications denied. And after one instance, she asked what the reason and was told, all right, it was due to the eviction. After a couple months, it became clear that the past eviction was going to be a continuing issue. She was once again forced to move in with family. I work with extremely resilient survivors like this woman on a daily basis, but they're facing a housing system that is failing them and their children. I appreciate your time and energy on the eviction reform, and I'm hopeful for the benefits that these bills can have for victim survivors in our community if they're passed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now we're joined by Kristen Rosenberger from the Greater Twin Cities United Way. Welcome to the committee. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Kristen Rosenberger and I'm the Director of Advocacy and External Engagement for Greater Twin Cities United Way. And I'm also here to testify in support of House Files 20, 1060 and uh, 265. At Greater Twin Cities United Way, our mission is to build pathways toward prosperity and equity for all, touching over 500,000 lives across the nine county metro area. We fund over 95 service organizations that do amazing work every day to support our communities, such as Ujama Place, who you'll hear from very shortly. Through our work, we know that a stable home is the foundation that enables Minnesotans to thrive. Yet in 2020, our 211 resource helpline received over 70,000 calls related to housing needs. So we know this need is very great. Many of our families struggle to access and maintain stable housing with more than 15,000 evictions filed across the state each year. And following an eviction, families can spiral into crisis as we've heard from many examples already this morning. 
including unemployment, lower educational achievement for their children, and negative health outcomes. And all too often, an eviction can ultimately lead to homelessness. Additionally, evictions disproportionately impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color, which can trap renters into a cycle of unsafe, unstable, and unaffordable housing. But many of these evictions are actually avoidable. Over 90% are due to non-payment of rent. The 14-day prior notice provided in House File 20 will allow for more time for tenants to apply for emergency financial assistance and prevent many eviction filings altogether. Prior notice is standard practice in 43 states. Updated procedures provided in House File 1060 would allow for a more equitable and just eviction court process. And reforms provided in House File 265 would create a more reasonable process to document and expunge evictions on public record. We encourage you to pass the slate of bills to modernize and improve Minnesota's eviction processes. At Greater Twin Cities United Way, we know that eviction prevention is homelessness prevention. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now we're joined by Otis Sanders from Ujamaa Place. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members of the committee, my name is Otis Sanders. I'm the CEO of Ujamaa Place. I'm also on the board of directors at the Greater Twin Cities United Way. And I bring greetings from a committee of, of uh, Home for the All, as well as Head at Home Ramsey. Ujama Place, we serve uh, young black men between the ages of 18 and 30 that's trying to overcome poverty issues. Young men that's trying to remove barriers and our goal is to stabilize their lives so they can continue on a pathway to prosperity. In our program, we offer 37 services under the pillars of wellness, education, employment, and housing. By far, one of the most critical pieces that we offer is on the housing entity. It's arguably one of the greatest uh, barriers on the prosperity meter. By doing so, we're trying to address the wealth gap. We got information from our study that saying that the evictions that Muslim have is a direct related to non-payment of disproportionately for the men that we serve. When you're working through the intersection of racism and poverty, you're forced to make a lot of life decisions between rent and medical issues, rent, car payment, a lot of issue like that forces people to make unnecessary choices that put them in a cycle of continuous uh, poverty. A lot of these things create a situation of being unstable, unaffordable housing, couch hopping, and a lot of other unsafe positions. We're here to contend in support of House File 1060, House File 20, as well as House File 265. These amendments will have a direct impact on people's due process, as well as their ability to go on a pathway to prosperity. So we're talking about the length of being marginalized. We here to say that seven years is a long time for a person to recover, to be considered a barrier that will allow them to seek housing, to be able to get affordable housing as well. So we look, we love the expungement pieces of it, as well as the position that you can take to put people in a situation where stability is key. Again, what we are supporting the things that that directly related to non-payment, and we're again saying that is disproportionate affect people of color. So, you jump a place. Uh, we joined Great Twin City United Way as well as Head at Home Ramsey, Homes for All Coalition, in support of the bills being heard to support a formal process for evictions as well as reform evic eviction expungements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. And we're joined now by Bernadette uh, Hornig from Hornig Companies. Welcome to the committee. Here I am, hold on. Here I am, okay. Thank you, thank you for having me today. Yes, please identify yourself for the record. Um, my name's Bernadette Hornig. I'm here today as the board chair of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. I'm here to testify and bring to your attention some unintended consequences, I believe, um, will be the result of House File 20, should it be adopted. That's the 14-day notice proposal. I want to dispel the myth, first of all, that somehow evictions are a desired outcome for property owners and managers. As my prior testimony uh, testifiers identified, eviction actions are serious. And as a result, for most operators, they are a last resort. They cost significant amounts of money, are time-consuming and stressful, and may create an adversarial relationship with a resident. 
Additionally, costs associated with an eviction filing are rarely recovered when a tenant is evicted for non-payment and must be written off as bad debt, along with the staff time and attorney fees associated with these actions. For these reasons, operators are reluctant to file. Furthermore, these high costs incentivize managers to find alternative resolution to evictions, including helping residents find emergency rental assistance, creating payment plans, or settling with tenants to vacate prior to filing. If this proposal will take effect, I believe it will incentivize operators to serve eviction notices earlier than they would have in the past. It would no longer make sense to take the risk on an alternative resolution because if it was unsuccessful, another 14-day notice would be required. Instead, owners would be incentivized to deliver formal eviction notices as early as the second, third, or fourth day of the month to protect their rights to file an action in a timely manner. Furthermore, as the date of the court case is pushed out further, additional unpaid rent and legal costs would continue to accrue um, to the amount of bad debt. Currently, in many situations, opt to wait until the late rent grace period expires to even contact residents regarding late rent, which is typically between the fourth and sixth of the month, reminding them that the late fee of a late fee and that the rent is due. In most cases, this simple notice re resolves the issue. In a few of these cases, a follow-up notice is required to warn those with delinquent rent of a possible eviction action. Obviously, when we're operating under normal times right now, there's nothing happening related to late rent because of the executive order. OK, um, I fear that this notice in Minnesota could create an uptick in eviction filings. Currently, Minnesota is ranked third or fourth best in the country on per capita eviction filings, according to the work of Matthew Desmond and the eviction lab. For fair housing reasons, I'm concerned that if a notice letter states that an eviction action will be filed in 14 days, then more evictions will be filed when the time is reached. With that in mind, this legislation could actually increase the number of eviction filings in Minnesota rather than reduce. I urge you to carefully the unintended consequences of this bill so that we do not prematurely initiate eviction, which I believe will result in more eviction actions rather than fewer. Thank you for your consideration. I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. We're joined also by uh, Chris Kala from Hanbury and Turner. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christopher Kala. I'm an attorney with a law firm of Hanbury and Turner located in Minneapolis. My firm represents property owners and managers of rental properties. I offer testimony this morning regarding House File 1060. In my practice as an attorney, I have litigated many of the sections of the statute that are in consideration in this bill. I believe the proposed legislation does not improve the eviction process. I have concerns about all the proposed changes, but will focus my comments on sections 1, four, six, and 14. Uh, section one is pretty basic. It simply eliminates the word summary from the definition of an eviction proceeding. But what that does is it delimits the eviction to handle all disputes then that might exist between a landlord and a tenant. It will create more complex litigation and will create longer trials. Section four of the, of the proposal by making the proceedings non-public until a final judgment is ordered, creates essentially a secret proceeding which has serious First Amendment considerations, adds nothing to transparency of the process. Section six deprioritizes 504B 171 evictions. As a note, those are the evictions where a landlord commences for drugs, illegal guns, stolen property, or prostitution not the 90% of the breach cases, uh, the 90% the of non-payment cases. These serious 504B171 evictions are probably the most problematic issues causing habitability problems for their other tenants at buildings. And then with section 14, the elimination of the 504B.371 subdivision seven. As you've heard, 90% of the evictions in Minnesota are focused around non-payment. This appeal section focuses on those 10% of the cases which are for holdover and breach cases such as the 171. Essentially, if this section is adopted, it would allow a tenant who has committed gun violence at a property to lose in a trial, then appeal, but yet be able to remain in the property during the entire pendency of the appeal simply if they pay their ongoing rent. That's untenable. We would have, 
I would urge you to not adopt the statute. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And finally, uh, Cecil Smith from the uh, Multi-Housing Association. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank you, Chair Hausman. Uh, Chair Hausman, members of the committee, my name is Cecil Smith. I'm president and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. I come before the committee to respectfully raise our opposition to the major expansion of eviction record expungement in House File 265. We believe it will lead to more challenges in the rental housing market than it intends to solve. According to Matt Desmond's eviction lab, Minnesota's eviction rate is fourth lowest in the United States. Among large cities, Minneapolis, Minneapolis's rate ranks 201st, St. Paul is 217th, and Rochester is 225th. While concentrated areas of concern remain, Minnesota's eviction rate fell faster and farther than the country, rest of the country over the past decade. While every eviction is a crisis for the renters and manager, we do not have an eviction crisis. We did not have one and we will not have one. Energy and effort this moment should be on the eviction and lease termination moratorium off ramp. To the specifics of the bill, subdivision three of this bill would seal a public record. An eviction action filing is a public record and it would be automatic and immediate. That would raise the screening limits for all other residents since a manager would have to assume that someone relocating had an eviction filing and a pending case. This is a terrible unintended consequence of the bill for all renters. This bill would also allow most records to be expunged immediately after the court reaches the conclusion or the case is settled. After three years, 100% of eviction records would be expunged regardless of the circumstances which give rise to the eviction action. Eviction records are one of the many factors considered by most managers during the application screening process. Failing to properly screen applicants sets them up for failure, hurts other renters, and could be a financial and legal liability for owners and operators. Our members are additionally concerned when we examine the language in section one. Under the proposal, the courts can determine that an eviction action is, quote, no longer a reasonable predictor of future tenant behavior, end quote. The courts are not operators of rental units. Judges are not housing management professionals and are certainly not currently equipped to understand what creates a reasonable predictor of future tenant behavior. When looking at criminal record expungements, there are procedures in place that must be followed to meet the standard of no longer a reasonable predictor but this statute provides no such guidance. Finally, allowing expungement by agreement of the parties to the action without considering whether concealment is in the public interest is an extraordinary step that allows, even potentially for financial compensation, two interested parties to control the fate of a public record to the detriment of others. This is a concern as we have data which shows Minnesota's eviction rate ranks among the very best in the country. This elimination of this data set could create less public scrutiny of the actions of tenants and landlords alike. I appreciate that Minnesota has reduced evictions further than most states, but this concealment of records will no longer provide these invaluable insights into eviction data. I thank you for the opportunity to bring this before you. Thank you for your testimony and to all the testifiers, the, all three of these bills go, go next to the Judiciary Committee if you want to um, continue to track uh, the path of, of these bills. Uh, members, um, uh, first of all, I, if you have any questions of the testifiers, and then as we uh, make every motion for every bill, you can uh, address um, uh, the author. So, uh, Mr. Wirth, is there any, are there any questions of the testifiers? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, Representative Howard has a question. Representative Howard. Madam Chair, I, I think my question, well, this I, I guess this could be for uh, one of our testifiers. Um, we just heard a previous uh, testimony, in, you know, talking about how Minnesota uh, is doing well uh, compared to our counterparts in terms of eviction cases. But does some, could someone testify to the volume of eviction cases we've seen in Minnesota? And in particular, um, I, I know that there's particular areas of the state uh, that have seen high volume of eviction cases. And um, I would just highlight that for every Minnesotan that experienced an eviction, that's a crisis for that individual. 
Um, and just curious if someone would testify to some of the uh, data in terms of what we're seeing in Minnesota in terms of volume of evictions. Do any of our testifiers, it occurs to me maybe Ms. Rosenberger, anybody? Otherwise uh, Madam, we'll- Madam Chair, Ms. Dobson was seeking recognition. Who is it? Ms. Dobson. Oh, from, uh, from legal aid, uh, Ms. Dobson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Howard for that um, excellent question. And I think it's important to talk about um, the statistics and data available. Um, I would just point out that while um, some of the data that uh, was referenced by testifiers from the eviction lab um, does rank Minnesota on the lower end of eviction filing rates, staff and attorneys on staff at the eviction lab have specifically noted um, that Minnesota is a, there's something exceptional about the data there because of expunged cases um, not showing up in some of those filing records, which is something that um, legal aid has worked really hard in recent years to, to work on um, seeking expungements for those who, for whom it's warranted. So I would just make that point about the data that there, the eviction lab itself has noted that the Minnesota data has some, um, there are some caveats to, to that filing data. In a typical year prior to COVID-19, um, there are approximately 15 or 16,000 eviction cases filed in a year. Um, and then approximately uh, half of those are from the Twin Cities area. So as um, Representative Howard, you mentioned, this is, we're talking about thousands and thousands of families, and there are 600,000 rental homes, uh, households in Minnesota that face eviction upon any of the uh, the grounds that might arise. Thank you. Follow up, Representative Howard. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's really helpful. I might have a comment um, when we get to the final what? bill, but that's okay. really that's helpful. Right. Thank you. Um, other questions of the testifiers, Ms. Stewart? Madam Chair, there are no other member questions. Okay. At this time. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the testifiers, and we'll, we'll move on then to um, our formal motions, and we'll begin. Uh, with House File uh, 20. Representative Hassan, would you like to move your bill? All right. All right. <laughs> now I'm unmuted. I was talking. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I move uh, House File 20 to be re referred to Judiciary and Civil Law. Okay, Representative Hassan moves uh, House File uh, 20 be re recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. Questions of the author. Mr. Worth, any? Madam Chair, there are no questions in the queue at this time. Okay. Uh, closing comments from Representative Hassan. Sorry, I'm having a very unstable internet here. Uh, oh. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say um, one of the testifiers has noted that uh, eviction is the last resort. I want to say that that's a myth. Eviction is sometimes used as the only resort. Uh, eviction hurts families. Eviction is costly, and it hurts Pipot communities more than any other community. So I just want to say that. With that, I ask for your support. Thank you, Madam. If there are no more uh, questions, um, Madam Chair, Representative uh, Tice has a question. Representative Tice. Representative Tice, you are muted right now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. I would just have to say that in the, all the years that we have uh, had rental property and NOAA folks, it really is one of the last, last resorts. It is timely. It is expensive. And I don't get money back. So um, I just, while Representative Hassan had said that it isn't, I, I really disagree with that. And and I think um, Ms. Hornig really had it on the ball. It is expensive. It is not an easy process to go through. And we've only had one in probably, uh, I'm trying to think here, 20 some years. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Mr. Worth? Madam Chair, no other questions. Uh, um, in that case, um, do you want to renew your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I renew my motion to uh, re refer uh, House File 20 to Judiciary and Civil Law. Representative Hassan uh, renews her motion that House File 20 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. 
Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? No. Eggbadge? Aye. Bliss? No. Gomez? Gomez? Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Far? No. Ryer? Aye. Gomez? Aye. All right, Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. Thank you. Um, there being uh, eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails, the bill is referred. And uh, then uh, House File 1060, Representative uh, Agbaje, if you would like to move your bill. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move uh, House File 1060 be recommended and uh, re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Finance and Civil Law. And you have a, uh, an author's amendment. And uh, uh, Representative Tice, um, I, I'm always willing to call a, um, a voice vote if you'd prefer otherwise with a, an author's amendment to get the bill before us uh, for discussion. Um, unless I hear a roll call requested, we'll do a, a voice vote so people can unmute. Those in favor of the author's amendment, uh, say aye. 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 Those opposed, that amendment uh, is adopted. That's now part of the bill. So questions to uh, the author. Mr. Worth. Madam Chair, Representative Tice has a question. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, after hearing some of the testimony, especially from Chris Kala, I am very concerned about what this means to um, landlords. And I think, as was mentioned before, I think some of these things can actually backfire and really make it a little bit harder for landlords to keep in business and to feel like they're doing the best they can for their tenants, especially safety wise. That is very concerning to me. Uh, but I'm also, Madam Chair, I, I appreciate the intent of the way this, this uh, committee meeting has gone, but I think it's a little bit confusing where it was so much information at one time and then just having all the testifiers and then and then waiting, I think it was just a little bit confusing. I can understand why you're doing it. They are very similar, but it, it just seemed a bit con confusing and in and, and ways sometimes hard to follow. Like, which one was that again? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. You know, which which bill were they addressing? Um, I don't think that was always yeah. clear. I appreciate that very much. And we'll take that very seriously as we do future planning. Um, Mr. Worth, any, any additional? Madam Chair, Representative Howard has a question. Representative Howard. Uh, th thank you, Madam Ch Chair, and a question for the author. Uh, there was some testimony related to um, incidents uh, of evictions when there's a, a serious uh, you know, public safety issue or a criminal offense. Would you comment to how your bill um, if it impacts the, those cases, um, if at all? Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Howard for that question. Yes, so you know, under 504B, Point one seven one that deals with um, specific emergency criminal incidents, and that part of the statute is untouched in this bill. So there's still the expedited um, availability to landlords who are having a very dire emergency situation with a tenant that they need to remove the tenant quickly. That still remains. Um, the other aspects of this bill really just deal with, you know, for a lack of a better term, kind of the run of the mill evictions that deal with non-payment of rent, or it might be some type of nuisance breach. Um, but but if in the case of a serious incident, that that is still available to landlords under this bill. Follow up, Representative Howard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that answer. Just a quick comment, I really support this bill. Um, we've heard a lot of testifiers on both sides, uh, you know, landlords and folks representing tenants 
allude to that eviction should be a last resort. And this bill seems like a way to actually match our laws with that sentiment and make sure that there's time and process uh, for, for that to, to hold true. Um, so thank you very much uh, for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Worth, any additional? Madam Chair, no other questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, Representative Agbaje, would you want to renew your motion? Yes, I renew my motion that House File 1060, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Uh, Representative Agbaje um, renews her motion that uh, House File 1060, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? No. Big Badger? Aye. Bliss? No. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Barr? No. And Dreyer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. There being eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails. Uh, the bill as amended is referred. And finally, House File 265, Representative Hassan, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move House File uh, 265 to be re repaired to Judiciary and Civil Law. Representative Hassan moves that House File 265 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Um, additional comments or questions of members? Madam Chair, I don't see any questions from members. And uh, Representative Hassan, do you have any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna thank all the testifiers and uh, the committee members for um, you know a wonderful discussion. I just wanna say that um, we all care about homelessness. We all care about Minnesotans who are struggling, um, who, whose lives have been uprooted because they have an eviction in their record. They can't rent anymore. And this isn't a problem. Yes, there is more evictions in the you know, metro, but this isn't a problem that's just uh, specifically happening in the metro. It's happening everywhere. And I wanna set the record to say that this is not landlord versus uh, you know, tenants, that we are favoring tenants and we're against the landlords. My district is 86% renters. I want good tenant, I mean, good landlords. I want landlords who, uh, you know, are by the book, are following the law, are not mistreating their, uh, you know, tenants. I also want to, you know, note that if people have eviction on their records, they can't rent, which means that they're going to be preyed on by slumlords, people who want to take advantage of. And these are the most vulnerable in our community. So with that, I ask for your support and I wanna put it out there that I am more than happy to work with anybody who wants to make this bills better. Thank you. And before she renews her motion, I'm just checking once more, Mr. Worth, if there are any additional member. Madam Chair, no questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, Representative Hassan, if you would uh, renew your motion. Yes, Madam Chair, I renew my motion to re-refer House File 265 to Judiciary and Civil Law. Representative Hassan um, renews her motion that House File 265 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? No. McBadget? Aye. Bliss? No. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Barr? No. Ryer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. There being eight A's and five nays, the motion prevails. The bill is uh, referred. Um, well, it was um, it was a lot of information, and uh, we we weren't quite sure if we were going to um, be pressing the clock, but we aren't. And um, 
unless Mr. Worth, you see anyone else who seeks recognition. Um, the next meeting of the housing, the next meeting of the Housing Finance and Policy Committee will be on Tuesday, February 23rd at 10:30 a.m. There being no other business before us, we are adjourned. <laughs>